This is my first experience giving a hybrid talk and I'm happy to see the people that have shown up at the faculty club here today. Thank you all. And I know there's a Zoom audience out there. We saw, saw a list, so welcome to those folks um, as well. This is not a research talk. And, and I should say that right up front. UCSD is a powerhouse in high altitude research and people like John West and Peter Wagner and Kim Prisk and Sue Hopkins and others um, have uh, done a huge amount, but this is more a talk by somebody who has enjoyed hiking a lot and getting up to some high altitude places and having to learn a little bit about why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling and what I might uh, do about it. I'm curious if there are people either here or on the Zoom audience who have experience uh, going to altitude and could say 30 seconds about what happened to them. I can pipe up. Um, so, about what 10, 10 years ago uh we bridge and i went to uh, drove up to the top of mount Haleakala on uh, on maui um and just to you know the traditional thing you go see the sunrise and and look around and uh i very quickly actually became um it got headache got disoriented got nauseous and sat in the car for quite a while and then dragged ourselves down about 6,000 feet and parked and I recovered. How long did it take to recover? I don't know. I took a nap. Yeah, we, we sat and napped there. So it may have been like an hour or so, an hour or two. Good. That's, that's a pretty uh, impressive and I think not uncommon experience, and I think it'll fit into some of what I'm going to uh, be talking about uh, as we move along here. Is there anybody else who'd like to say anything? As I said, this is this is really intended to be informal. There's going to be some stuff about uh, the physiology here. There's going to be some travel log kind of pictures, and that's kind of what I'm aiming for. Uh, I had an experience climbing Mount Fuji when I was a medical student at UCSD and was sick as a dog. Uh, the, uh, the intent was to go, get up to the top of Fuji and watch the sunrise. This is a very Japanese thing to do. Yeah. Um, you climb to within about 500 vertical feet or so many meters of the top and then spend the night in a single room um, rock enclosure with about 150 of your closest Japanese friends <laughs> get up at three in the morning and finish the climb to watch the sunrise. I was in pulmonary edema. It, really? was, it, was, it was bad. I didn't sleep at all. Uh, and uh, I've also had experiences uh, skiing in, you know, various different resorts where I'd have several days of um, chain stoke breathing and uh, headache uh hard time sleeping yeah. so there, it's getting better with as i get older though i think i i used to take acetazolamide for it but i don't yeah. do that anymore okay so there this is great there's some sort of common threads coming through here in terms of people who have gone up to altitude uh quickly and how what's the altitude of the, the summit of fuji I think it's about 12,000 feet, but I, I'm, I may be off. I don't know. Okay, but pretty substantial. Um, people are talking about headaches, GI problems, problems sleeping, maybe problems breathing. And that's gonna fit into what we're um, gonna be talking about here. And I'm pressing a right arrow and it's down here. Okay, I'm gonna need a little assistance here. Okay, you did something magic. So, click on the PowerPoint. Click on the PowerPoint. 
and then the arrow. Just yeah. Click on the PowerPoint. Oh, um, before you want, you clicked on participants. Mm -hmm. So now you have to click on just on the screen, and then do there. Okay, thank you. So here we are in uh, California, Mount Whitney, highest mountain in the lower uh, states. And this was sort of my introduction to altitude because as a maybe pulmonary fellow here, I decided it'd be fun to climb Mount Whitney. And so I took off and this is the trail that goes up uh, from close to the base uh, up to the summit. There are, I forget how many switchbacks, but very large number. And the way that people usually get there is to start in San Diego at the lower left and drive to Lone Pine. And that gets you up to about 4,000 feet. And then uh, maybe stay overnight in Lone Pine and then climb uh, to the summit the next day. And that's going up pretty high pretty quickly. Uh, what I did was drive to Lone Pine and I climbed up to uh, Whitney Portal and then, which is at, and I, I can't see the arrow on here, so you're going to have to just see where my arrow is there. Climbed up to Whitney Portal and then um, climbed up, hiked up a bit to a place where we bivouacked, stayed overnight, and then climbed to the summit. And the difference between doing that, which I and the friend did and two other folks did who, who drove to Lone Pine and then hiked the whole thing was pretty substantial. So just even acclimatizing for that period of time seemed to, to make a little bit of a difference. The things that, that I experienced there and that people have, have just described, I think fall into the category of acute mountain sickness and the, the spectrum of high altitude illnesses probably includes these three things, acute mountain sickness. Some people break out a separate high altitude headache. I, I don't know if you need to do that. It could be just said to be part of acute mountain sickness. And that's really common. People who go quickly to altitude, probably at least 50% of them uh, develop uh, acute mountain sickness. Much less common, and we'll talk about a little bit later, is high altitude pulmonary edema or high altitude cerebral edema, where the lungs or the brain uh, get involved. And those are pretty serious and life-threatening, whereas acute mountain sickness, it might feel life-threatening, but probably uh, is not so much. The acute mountain sickness usually happens fairly quickly within a few hours, I think for most people, of ascending to anything over about seven or 8,000 feet. And the symptoms are here. Headache, I think is the, by far and away, the, the thing that impresses most people. GI upset comes in second, fatigue, dizziness, difficulty sleeping is also another big one uh, that, that I think people experience. There's something called the Lake Louise scoring system or Lake Louise clinical score. It's used in research. It's self-administered and it describes the severity of the symptoms that you're experiencing. It's worth going through because it does list those symptoms. The, the diagnostic dimension of it is that you've gone up in altitude gotten a headache, and then uh, you've gotten one other score uh, that puts you above a total of three, and that gives you acute mountain sickness. So the scoring system recognizes headache, and then you get more points depending on whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. GI symptoms, fatigue and weakness, dizziness and lightheadedness, and you get more points the more severe each of those is. And then you can sum up those points and think of it as mild, moderate, or severe. The risk factors for acute mountain sickness have been mentioned uh, by uh, some of the folks that spoke at the beginning and shared their experience. Going up to a significant altitude, 
over probably 2,000 meters or 2,500 meters uh, and going up quickly, rate of ascent. And oftentimes you can't, can't uh, modify that. We'll come back to that. But uh, that is probably the most important uh, causative factor. A prior history of acute mountain sickness is something to be concerned about. And if you've had it once, it may happen again, as was mentioned. Age less than 50, and we'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> how with advancing age, or as I'd like to say, greater maturity, the uh, predisposition may be a little bit less. History of migraine uh, is a predisposing factor. A low ventilatory response to hypoxia is also a risk factor. And what that means is that uh, if somebody takes you to a research lab and gives you a low concentration of oxygen to breathe, your normal response, a normal response would be to breathe pretty vigorously. But if you don't breathe vigorously, if you have a blunted response to that, that is also a risk factor. It's possible that obesity and the lack of training can also be risk factors. And I put little stars next to a few of those because most of these things we can't control. We can't control what altitude we're going to, can't control whether we had a prior history, but those are a few variables that we can influence. What do you include in training? I beg your pardon? What do you include in training? Well, I don't, what I'm not including is exposure to hypoxia. I'm including muscle training. So, okay. right. uh, so running, wanting, physical training. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's worth mentioning here, in case it's not clear, something about the oxygen we're breathing. It, it sometimes is thought that the air is becoming, uh, is having a lower concentration, a lower composition of oxygen as we go up. That's not true. Uh, the air we're breathing at sea level or at high altitude is all about 21% oxygen. But what does change is the barometric pressure. So the pressure that's driving oxygen molecules across, for example, the membranes into your bloodstream and your lung is lower at altitude than it is at sea level. And that's just making the point by showing the colored balls that are nitrogen and oxygen on the right. There are fewer of them at altitude, but the ratio stays about the same. So normally, what happens to us when we go to altitude? Normal responses include an increase in heart rate at rest or with any level of exertion. And I think it's fair to say at a lower level of exertion. So walking up a flight of stairs here at sea level, you may not be aware of your heart pounding, doing the same thing at eight or 9,000 feet. You may have a, much more of a sensation of increased heart rate. Increased rate and depth of breathing, same thing. Um, dyspnea, shortness of breath, walking up that flight of stairs gets better as soon as you stop or very shortly after you stop. But, but the act of doing it causes more shortness of breath than you would expect. Dehydration is something to really keep, keep an eye on because it's common and it's frequently uh, not responded to in the same way that we would respond at sea level. That is people can get dehydrated at altitude because they're urinating more because they're increased breathing. And as you breathe, you're exhaling moist air and you're not drinking as much because your GI system may feel kind of upset. So it's easy to get dry, to have a lower blood volume because of being dehydrated. And it's important to, to just be aware of this and kind of force yourself to take fluid, even if you may not feel like it. Poor sleep is another really frequent annoyance with frequent arousals, uh, not being able to get to sleep. Um, people who write about this talk about vivid dreams being a part of this. 
blood vessels in the lung constrict, and that may be part of the reason that people can get this unusual uh, high, uh, high altitude pulmonary edema, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And this just, I don't know how well this is gonna show up here. I guess possibly it's legible. This print is small, but it shows the altitudes of some, some peaks that people like to go to, Mont Blanc, Kilimanjaro, uh, Everest at the very top. And in the arrows over towards the left are listed some of the things that may happen to you with acute mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema kicking in around 2,500 or 3,000 meters. Um, and as you get up higher, problems with learning, spatial memory impaired. And when you get very high, more of the problems that are listed there. Now, it was mentioned that uh, somebody, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the name, who, had experience, who spoke earlier had experienced some problems, but uh, as uh, maturity was, was coming along, there wasn't a need to uh, treat them quite as much. And there is evidence that maturity can be advantageous. And this uh, was a study that was done looking at a little over a thousand subjects. They had not taken the set of zolomite, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And it's looking at them uh, grouped by age. And on the left side, uh, people less than 35, 36 to 52 and over 52 about 300 and some people in each group. And you can see that the solid black bars show the incidence of acute mountain sickness as, patient, as these people have gone uh, to high altitude. Over on the right is high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema in the black and gray bars. And those are also significantly um, less frequent in people of uh, older age. This is another uh, statement, it's by the same authors about aging and cardiorespiratory response to hypoxia. And I just listed the key points there. They had shown that an older age was associated with a lower risk of severe altitude diseases. And they looked at a larger number of, of subjects, 4,600, and thought that aging was associated with the blunting of the uh, increase in heart rate with altitude and that an increase in ventilatory response did occur leading to maintenance of arterial oxygen saturation. Uh, endurance training, and I think that was training that was accomplished at low altitude uh, muscular training was beneficial in adaptive responses and they concluded that cardiac and ventilatory adaptations allow older people to challenge hypoxia similar to younger ones when performing moderate exercise. So here's summary number one. Summary number one. These are recommendations, and it's largely from observational data, that with a sense to altitudes that are in the eight to nine or 10,000 foot range, that uh, people can do pretty well. The uh, rate of ascent really matters. And increasing in the uh, sleeping elevation, that is if you're hiking, the elevation at which you're sleeping at night shouldn't be increased by more than 1,000 to 2,000 feet per night if you're going up to those altitudes. Resting every three or four days is a good idea sleeping at the same elevation for at least one additional night is a good idea. The problem is that if you're doing something like, say, going to Cusco, usually you're getting there by airplane. So what are you doing? You're, you're leaving at sea level and how many hours, a couple hours later, uh, there you are at 11,000 feet, uh, one hour flight I've got here. And, uh, you can't do that kind of stage descent that I just uh, was talking about. So what can you do? And that's something we need to talk about a little bit. I got to, to Cusco on the way to Machu Picchu 
which isn't quite as high. It's about 9,000 feet above sea level. But uh, I'll show you a few pictures of that just because this is fun to have some of the uh, travelogue dimension of this as well. Um, we, we took a uh, train and bus to get there. And the bus towards the end goes up this series of switchbacks, leaving you uh, at Machu Picchu. And behind Machu Picchu, there's this other smaller peak called Huayna Picchu, uh, which is there. And its altitude uh, is 2634. Got to be one there. And that's Rosa. Rosa was a little uh, guide that we had uh, because this was an extension of a, of a tour that we had done to the Galapagos. And Rosa, we'd had dinner with Rosa the night before. And my wife and I were there and she said, well, tomorrow you're going to climb on Huayna uh, Picchu. And I thought, okay, that, that sounds like it could be fun. And I, my wife thought, in your dreams, lady, this is <laughs> not gonna happen. So this is setting out to climb up Huayna Picchu. And that's the, those little steps are the trail. And we made it to the top. And when you look down, it's really pretty, pretty um, dramatic. And you're quite up high above, above Machu Picchu. And the trail down is the same thing. It, it's a pretty steep fall off on the left side. And the little Inca feet were about six inches long, I think. And they fit pretty well in those steps. My feet did not. And I came down some of that in a very unmanly sort of way on my rear end, uh, which I am not ashamed to really admit to. Rosa did just fine, but I think she'd done it before. So what can you do in this circumstance? Well, controlled ascent is great, but if you're gonna get on an airplane and an hour later be there, that, uh, that's not gonna happen. So there is some pharmacology that's available. Uh, Diamox or cetazolamid is probably the most important one to talk about. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are a second. A steroid, dexamethasone, is talked about possibly best, best reserved for treatment of acute mountain sickness rather than uh, taken preventatively. And then there's the question of coca leaf products. And our experience was that almost the second we got off the plane, and certainly by the time we got to a hotel, people were offering us cocoa tea or other cocoa leaf products to uh, take uh, as a prevention for headache problems and other symptoms of mountain sickness. So let's look a little bit at each of those. And let's see, I'd like to get rid of that if I can. How about if I just stick it there? Is there a way to get rid of it? Just tell me what to do. No. That's okay. People, there are some people. <laughs> uh, just leave it. Um, you know, low risk. I've I've said some of this before. Low risk is if you've um, not had any history of altitude illness, you're not going up that high. You're taking a couple of days to get there, uh, going in, in incremental stages and maybe fewer than 500 meters a day and you're acclimatizing. Well, as we said, it's hard to do that if you're in an airplane. So anything more than that, I won't go through the details here, is moderate risk. Uh, you've, you've had a his history of acute mountain sickness uh, or you're ascending to 2,500 meters in a day, or you're ascending higher, you, even if you haven't had a history or more than 500 meters a day. And I think uh, for people with moderate or high risk, it's probably worth uh, taking some drug. And the one that gets the most attention is acetazolamide uh, or Diamox. Now, remember we said the, the normally the increased breathing due to low oxygen is blunted. Uh, 
by an accompanying loss of exhaled carbon dioxide. So if I'm breathing hard and I exhale uh, overly because I'm stimulated to breathe hard, I'm exhaling a lot of carbon dioxide and my body and my bloodstream is becoming a little bit alkalotic. And that normally uh, blunts the response to low oxygen. The cetazolamide modifies that. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, causes a loss of bicarbonate in the urine, and it makes your body a little bit acidotic. So that metabolic alkalosis is avoided and the increased breathing due to low oxygen is maximum and blood oxygenation is optimized. There may be other ways that Dimox works. This is one of the ones that is probably given the most respect. The recommendations for people with uh, more than just mild risk of acute mountain sickness or 125 milligrams of Diamox twice daily, starting a day before ascending. There are side effects, tingling of fingers and toes, little numbness around your mouth and altered taste. One of the items for which the taste is altered is our carbonated beverages. So if you are thinking of carrying a few bottles of beer to your altitude and you're taking Diamox, you're probably going to be disappointed. It really isn't very good on Diamox. It is a mild diuretic and the wisdom about making sure that you stay well hydrated uh, is at least doubled when uh, taking Diamox. It possibly can be discontinued a couple days after reaching the highest elevation. And that, that's a point that I don't think I mentioned before, is that a lot of times when you get to altitude and you have symptoms of acute mountain sickness, if you can live through them for a day or so, uh, you're going to feel better. Or at least I think most people are going to feel better. And that's why this comes. What about non-steroidals? There are some studies about them as well. Uh, people who have have uh, looked at the randomized clinical trials and compared subjects who took non as opposed to those who were just taking a placebo. And in uh, three clinical trials, my second bullet point there, with about 349 patients, the uh, Lake Louise scoring system showed that in uh, about 27% of patients on non-steroidals and 43% of patients on placebo, there was uh, acute mountain sickness. So there, there does appear to be benefit. And the conclusion is that non-steroidals can be a safe and an effective alternative, but uh, that more studies uh, might be warranted. My takeaway from the reading I've done is that there's probably stronger evidence for the use of Diamox than for non steroidals But I'd be interested in, in other people's uh, comments on that. I really love this study. This, this is a study on coca leaf products. And there's a, I think there's a lot of debate between the travel industry that kind of endorses coca leaf products and the serious North American uh, high altitude physiologists who don't have much respect for coca leaf products. The reason I like this is the two medical students in these uh, Texas at Houston obviously got maybe a little bit of money and, and designed a research project. And they really did it pretty well. They had some mentorship and they had some good statistics in their paper. And they went and they sat in the departure lounge of the Cusco airport and they interviewed uh, almost a thousand travelers. And they found that 16% of them had used acetazolamide, 60 some percent had used the coca leaf. And that's because people are offering it to you. You, you don't have to go out and try to find it. it. It usually is there in your, in the airport or in the, in the hotel. And the symptoms, headache in 60%, um, 
acute mountain sickness with a Lake Louise uh, clinical score greater than three in almost 50% and greater than six, which is reasonably significant in 17%. And they found that there were a few things, and this was with a multivariant to regression analysis that was done pretty nicely, that there was a lower incidence of acute mountain sickness associated with greater age, age over 60, stage descent, people who had come up gradually rather than uh, arrived uh, by airport, by airplane, and uh, using acetazolamide. They found that use of coca leaf product was associated with a higher incidence of acute mountain sickness. Now, there are probably all kinds of reasons why this those observations could be could be criticized. But I, I just have a lot of respect for these two medical students, they were second year medical students who went and did this and put together a pretty, pretty interesting report. So can I ask a question? Please. So you've got about a thousand subjects, 80% or maybe a little bit more had taken some sort of precaution in their mind. Uh, but out of that thousand, you still had 60% that developed headache. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very, very, very common. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, let me, let, me, let me ask if there are questions from the Zoom audience or comments. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, it's, I think it's been suggested that uh, when there's a gradient in pH between the blood and the CSF, that the symptoms, uh, that, that, that seems to be concurrent with the, the, the presence of, of, of the symptoms we've been talking about. And that as, this, as that gradient equalizes over, the, over several days, uh, that the symptoms go away. And I wonder if you think there's any causation involved in that association. Yeah, um, the, the bit I know about this is that the causation of the headache is, is unclear. And if, if what you're saying um, would relate to vascular tone and, and possibly vascular irritation or spasm, I think it would make sense. I think there, as I'm remembering, there normally is a gradient. So you're likely talking about an accentuation of that and then the re Virtual to the normal gradient. Roger, I, yep. I'm puzzled by the age effect. Um, the uh, and I'm wondering whether it's how do you disentangle the fact that we move about differently? Uh, maybe if we're above sixty, we're not pushing ourselves so hard. Uh, I know I used to ski a great deal, and um, uh, over the years. I got to be a much better skier and didn't have to work at it so hard. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so maybe I, I wasn't pushing myself as much as, as I aged. How do you disentangle that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very good point. And I think it is difficult to address in this study, um, these uh, students did not describe any more than what is here, the activity level of the people that they were talking to. So it, it's an important variable. I haven't seen anything about uh, how it's been dissected out in the analysis. The other thing is I've, I vaguely ref recall that uh, one of the benefits of age uh, is headaches and migraine intensity and frequency that uh, you get migraines regardless of altitude. They're much worse uh, in younger persons than uh, older. So I'm kind of wondering whether the, the people who get the headaches on the mountain get the headaches off the mountain as well. Uh, and are you talking about specifically migraine headaches or the headache of the 60% of these people are getting? Specifically migraine. 
What, what the way I'm interpreting uh, what was reported is that people who get migraines were more likely to get the headache of acute mountain sickness. And that was not described as, as migraine headache. Could it have been? I don't know. Uh, it, that wasn't broken out. Roger. Um, hi, this is Sonia. Um, hi. hi. Um, so I've been to Cusco, which I think is about nine, 10,000 feet. And I've been to Tiger's Nest, which I think is also somewhere close to that. And I did take Diamox. I got the tingling, but otherwise I, I did okay. But that was over 10 years ago. And I'm playing with the idea of going to the foothills of the Himalayas, but they tell us that would be at around 14,000. Should I worry about at my age going to that height? Well, um, you know, it's, I don't think it's appropriate for me to give individual advice to. Right. Yeah. Well, let's say in general, should a 70 yeah. plus person who hasn't had problems when younger. Yes, I, I would endorse that vigorously. I think, uh, you should. I'm going to have some slides about this as we go along a little bit. But um, if, if there are no reasons, uh, you know, sp specific medical reasons that are keeping you from doing that, I'd talk to your uh, No, of course. About of course. It. But, so age alone won't necessarily make the susceptibility worse if you weren't, if one wasn't susceptible at a younger age. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm going to give you a little personal experience as we get right. along here. Thanks. Okay, let me, oh, I've got to click on something. There we go. Um, a little bit more on the coca leaf just to tie this up. Coca leaf products, uh, the, the utility and prevention of altitude il illness has never been systematically studied. They shouldn't be substituted for other preventive measures. I, I think that's a pretty reasonable um, reasonable conclusion. So summary number two, drugs can help. Prevention, acetazolamide is the mainstay, non-steroidals can be useful. The evidence is not so strong for coca leaf products. So how about extreme altitude? Uh, and I got involved with this a few years ago, four years ago now. I decided I wanted to go and climb Kilimanjaro in, in uh, Africa. And I decided I wanted to climb the Western Breach route. And you might say, why this route? And I, I should, well, I'll say two things. The um, normal route involves uh, a final day or so where you start hiking at about 11 o'clock at night so that you reach the summit by sunrise. And that just sounded horrible. I, I, I really didn't want to do that. So I read about some different routes. And the Western Breach Route gets you up through a breach into the caldera of this ancient volcano. And you sleep there. And you can start hiking towards the summit at 2 or 3 in the morning. So that, was, that was, uh, sounded a lot better to me. Saying it standing here right now, it doesn't sound great, but uh, it certainly <laughs> did sound better. And I have two sons, and I'd asked, um, I'd asked my, my older son if he wanted to go, and he said, absolutely, this sounds like a great thing to do. And I asked my younger son if he wanted to go, and he said, you know, I know I should want to go, and I really don't. So he made a good decision, and, and so the two of us went. And I told David, the older son, that we were going to go this Western Breach route. And he, he um, said, are you out of your mind? Because this was the description of the Western Breach route that he came up with. And I don't know if we, can you see all this on the, on the screen? Okay. Um, it's challenging. Well, that's okay. The danger is that the melting glaciers above the route, and as they retreat, they're, they're releasing rocks. And there was a big rock fall, and it had killed some people. 
And they're very careful now about, uh, they closed it for a few years. And now um, they have you go through that uh, part of the hike uh, before sunrise, before the sun has hit the ice and the rocks presumably are not gonna come tumbling down and do bad things to you. As you climb the mountain, the orders are, and the guides are telling you to walk very, very, very slowly the, the whole way except for this one area where the rocks can come down. <laughs> they say, you know, please go quickly. So it's six nights up and they're, they're, they're having us do what we've talked about, which is take a graded ascent and then uh, one night down. And it gets up pretty high. It gets up to 19,000 feet. And I uh, thought that it would probably be wise to do some training ahead of time, which just meant walking up and down the hills in uh, Del Mar. And I used uh, Diamox and I, I was taking Naperson for some musculoskeletal pain and I kept taking that. And the ascent profile looks like this, where you do go up uh, pretty slowly and take um, uh, one day it's not on there very clearly, but one, one day where you don't hike at all, it was a Barranco camp. So you're acclimatizing slowly there and then climbing up uh, to Arrow Glacier. And then uh, the more hazardous is the climb from Arrow Glacier to Crater Camp. And then a quick uh, up to the summit. So you don't have to get up at 10 or 11, start hiking at 10 or 11 at night. And then the hardest part of the whole trip is hiking downhill from this, for me, from the summit to uh, get out because you've hiked up slowly, but that descent is about 9,000 feet in, in the day, which is pretty tough. So what can happen at these higher altitudes? Two things that are worth talking about. One is high altitude pulmonary edema. And it's a diagnosis that's usually preceded by acute mountain sickness. But it's, it's uh, pulmonary uh, impairment. It's dyspnea, cough, decreased exercise, pink frothy sputum, poor gas exchange, so you're cyanotic, you're blue. If somebody takes an x-ray, uh, you can see changes on it. And, well, it's, it uh, is quite rare, below 8,200 feet I have there. Um, it, it's, it's not common at higher altitudes. It's maybe a couple percent of people that ascend, but it is potentially life-threatening and it really needs to be recognized and uh, treated uh, very quickly in order to, to keep people from dying. The treatment is it's oxygen wrong. if it's present, but the most important treatment is descent and get, getting people down as quickly as possible. And there are two ways to do that. One is by usually carrying them. And it was a little disheartening on Kilimanjaro to see these litters occasionally by the side of the path that uh, were there for, uh, if needed. The other descent can happen very quickly in a gamma bag, which is a bag that's pictured here, where you put the subject with high altitude pulmonary beam inside it and pump it up and pressurize it so that the pressure, the ambient pressure inside the bag and the pressure of the oxygen molecules inside the bag is what it would be if you were to go down several thousand feet. And that can be life-saving. Oh, you go backwards. Uh, so oxygen descent, either in person or in a gamma bag, and steroid are the things that uh, people have used and believe are effective in treating high altitude pulmonary edema. As I say, it's uncommon, a couple percent of people, but something that the uh, hikers and certainly the guides are very attuned to and keep an eye out for. We had had uh, oximeter, they had an oximeter, and we were measuring our hemoglobin saturation uh, with a finger oximeter every morning and evening as we uh, went up. 
The other organ that can get affected is the brain, high altitude cerebral edema. Diagnosis based on two things. One is altered consciousness and the other is sort of the wide based trunken sailor gait or what is professionally called truncal ataxia. Uh, that can also be fatal within hours. Very rarely seen below perhaps 4,000 meters and, and uncommon half a percent to a percent above, uh, above there. Treatment is pretty much what we just described, descent, gamma bag, option, oxygen, dexamethasone. So there's some things for people to be aware of. Uh, they're uncommon, but need to be thought of it. So summary number three, avoiding altitude illness. Ascend slowly if possible. Diamox, non training, hydration. So I'm gonna show you some pictures because that's part of what we're doing today of uh, going up Kilimanjaro and you start out and this gives you the route that we took. The whole, the whole trip is 40 kilometers. So you, a strong hiker could do that as about 25 miles, could do that in a day or a day and a half. That would be a mistake. Uh, it, it really is good to do the graded ascent. You start at a low altitude in a rainforest kind of uh, environment. Okay, now this is the quiz. I didn't tell you you were going to have a quiz today, but there's a quiz and this is it. Can you pick out the one companion who did not take Diamox on our trip? <laughs> it's it's the, our buddy in the black shirt there on the left. And he just felt terrible. And he's the only person who didn't take Dymex. So it's not a controlled study, but it was, you know, it, it was a pretty profound uh, message to me that maybe it's helpful. Now, maybe he had other unusual takes on life and uh, maybe that influenced the finding, but he really had a tough time. You, you ascend, you get up to where the scrub is lower. The porters are essential because they're carrying a lot of the things. I love this one because the fellow in the middle has several dozen eggs on his head. And uh, that's how the eggs were getting to altitude. Uh, some of it's a little bit steeper and, and uh, sketchier, but it was all quite, quite straightforward to do. The scenery was just wonderful. We had good weather. Eventually you get up to where it's more of a moonscape. Uh, well above the uh, tree line and very limited vegetation. Um, the mountain, the summit is there now in full view. The route up the mountain um, from, from here, if that's the arrow, up through the Western Breach, which is gonna be up through there, is the part where the rock fall is, is something to be mindful of. Along the way, there's some dramatic outcroppings. When we got to, to below the rockfall area, uh, they took us um, and showed us where we would be hiking the next day. They said you had to begin your hike no later than 5:30 in the morning, and uh, that and wear a helmet and move along. So that's the area where we're going to go and. We made it up uh, from Arrow Glacier into the crater camp, uh, coming to the place where uh, we should start being careful. And there are people are with their little headlamps uh, on going up through that area. This is another picture that's kind of fun because it shows everybody really happy. We've all made it. Nobody got hit by a rock. Everybody is smiling. But if you look closely, those are the guides and the porters that are smiling and the the uh, people in the hiking crew are sitting down kind of, you know, in full recovery mode uh, on the snow below them. Uh, getting up closer to the top is more of a scramble, but when you finally get up there, the view is dramatic. There, there's not much left in the way of glacier up on top. And I, I forget what the name of this, this glacier was, but. It is uh, said that you should go and put your hand on the glacier and that you should make a wish. 
And so that my son and I are doing that there. And I am pretty sure that everybody who's wishing is wishing exactly the same thing when they're doing that, which is let this go well. You sleep uh, in the crater uh, that night and then the next day uh, get ready early um, and get up to this iconic sign that's uh, on the summit. And then the trip down was is tough, just descending that amount. But when you get down, you're there. Uh, you can feel good about yourself. Uh, I did put in a little bit of slides, and I'm, I've, I've kind of debated about whether to include this slide. This was advice that's in a uh, high altitude medicine and biology uh, called the effect of high altitude exposure on older individuals and patients with coronary artery disease. And it points out that if you have coronary artery disease, altitude can exacerbate uh, ischemic heart disease, that cardiac events uh, can occur in older and unfit people within the first few days of altitude recommending ensure optimal fitness, acclimatize slowly, optimize medical treatment, consider an exercise test at sea level before going. And then the conclusion, which to my mind is a little bit rosier than I would have expected, given these considerations, most older individuals with coronary heart disease should be able to tolerate exposure to high altitude safely and with minimal increased risk. And I think if, uh, I were speaking to somebody who had established coronary artery disease, I would have them talk to their cardiologist pretty seriously about whether it was a good idea to go to high altitude or not. I, I, uh, I, I take this with a grain of salt.